Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm your host, Deb Philman. And today on my show, I have with me Larry Sand, and we are going to be talking about Uvalde and what happened there. But before I get into the topic, I would like to ask you to please like and share this broadcast. If you are new to the channel, The Reason We Learn, welcome, and I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber so you can be notified when we have conversations like this or when I publish original content. We talk about all things related to education here on this channel, and I think uh, you know we have some pretty hard-hitting conversations. Today will be no exception. Now, if you're not familiar with Larry, he's a former classroom teacher. He's the president of the nonprofit California Teachers Empowerment Network, which is a nonpartisan, nonpolitical group dedicated to providing teachers and the general public with reliable and balanced information about professional affiliations and positions on educational issues. Um, he writes for California Policy Center and also um, the uh, uh, for Kids and Country. And today we're going to be talking about his most recent piece, "The Sandstorm of All Day: The Way Forward." Welcome, Larry. Nice to be with you, Dad. Thank you. You're so welcome. So you took this on. Um, this is a big topic, and it's currently causing a lot of polarized conversation. What's your What's your take on? on that you know I'll, you know when it, things like this happen understandably everybody looks for reasons everybody points fingers and uh and 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 and, and a lot of the criticisms are just I, I i don't think that getting rid of guns writ large is a very i mean it's not going to happen it's a bad idea anyway as i think i mentioned in the piece mm -hmm. that there at this point there are more guns than people in the country. So e even if you banned all gun sales tomorrow, we still have 380 million guns floating around. And the bad guys and the kooks are always going to figure out, you know, how to get their hands on one. So it's really up to good people to protect themselves and their loved ones. And in the case of students, you know, in, in case of teachers, they're students. Right, right. So in this, in, in we, one of the things that comes up in the conversation around school shootings is this is, keeps happening. It's and they they'll you'll hear it keeps happening because we don't do anything, let's say about the guns. But I'm looking at it and saying, well, what have we done besides the guns? And is it working? What about the things we have done or haven't done? What do you what do you think about the steps that have been well, taken? If you don't mind, I want to go back to the very first thing you said about keep happening. And, yes. and, and frankly, they don't keep happening. I, I, Ed Week reported that there have been 27 school shootings this year. And that's like, <sighs> but, you know, they count a school shooting like what, one kid got shot. I mean, it's not a good thing, obviously, but a, a single student got shot outside of a school, I think, in a parking lot at a basketball game. Now that, you know, is it a school shooting? Okay, but, it, you know, we're talking about mass school shootings. And in fact, there have been 13 mass school shootings since 1966, not 27 this year so far, as Ed we reported. So it's very rare. And I mean, it's, you have a much, much greater chance of being killed in a car accident or, uh, I mean, you know, in a swimming pool than a school shooting. So they're very rare. Uh, now, as to what we can do, um, uh, well, I mean, th there are laws on the books that, that we need to enforce. There's something called the red flag law, which enables the government to rightfully, I think, take a firearm away from, you know, somebody said, okay, I'm going to go out and buy a gun and, and shoot up the school and, and shoot up the town and shoot up the mayor and shoot up the governor and shoot up the president. Yeah, that person, okay, sorry, but you can't have a gun now until you uh, get some help, serious help. And uh, the other thing is, I think they're called straw laws. Um, where, straw purchase, yeah. Yeah, where, you know, if I have a friend who can't own a gun because he's a felon. I can go buy a gun and give it to him. That is a crime. That person should not, ha not only not be able to buy a gun, he should not be able to use a gun. So if we start enforcing laws that are already on the books, it, it would go a long way. Nothing's a cure-all, which eventually, I think, comes down to self-protection. Right, right. Now, 
there, aside from the the people lying about statistics and making it all so very scary, what do you think about how they've presented this to children? I've seen children doing walkouts at school and teachers leading the way uh, and involving kids in this argument. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, uh, it, ter turning children into activists is disgusting. I mean, in for any reason. And especially here, yeah. I mean, the, the teachers' unions have been, uh, you know, not surprisingly front and center. And you know, we need to get rid of guns, and we need more gun laws, and we need this, and we need that. And of course, you know, this affects teachers, and then teachers in infect, affect, and infect their kids with this nonsense. And I'm sure the teachers who do this think they're doing a justified and and you know, justifiable thing, and it's not. It's wrong. And I, I would love to know how many teachers actually present different sides of this issue. You know, some people think we need to get rid of guns and some people think we need, you know, to make sure that the right people have guns. And I retired in 2009, but um, if, if, and I'm in California now and we, we don't have a carry law, but if we did have a carry law, I would carry a gun. I would have no compunction about doing that. Mm-hmm. And as I mentioned, we, 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 we did, obviously not everybody should. I think we need to train teachers, have them go through, you know, just like cops and soldiers go through classes and how to use, when to use, where to use. And, and clearly teachers would need to go through that. We would pay for their training and, and, and frankly, give them a few extra bucks a year because they're taking on an added responsibility. I was like, I was a testing coordinator in my school. I got a stipend of like $1,500 a year because I took on extra work. So any, any teacher who wants to carry a gun should get extra money. And, you know, and, and not that many teachers will do it because too many teachers buy into the uh, nonsense that, you know, it's, uh, we, need, we need less guns in school. You know, we, we need to right. be, schools need to be a safe place. Ironically, guns will make them safer, but most teachers don't see that. Right, right. I think even in the case of kids bringing their own gun to school in the sense of, you know, sneaking it in. And I mean, here in Charlotte, where I live, uh, one year, I, we weren't even halfway through the year. And they're like, well, that's the 17th gun. It was confiscated at a, you know, from a kid's backpack or whatever. And they, you know, they were involved in sort of gang activity. They were involved in drugs. They were involved in different things. They weren't bringing it to school to shoot up the school necessarily. It was just, they were bringing guns on the campus because they had a, their other reasons, right? So when you talked about the parking lot shooting, for example, and they're collecting these guns, you know, from the kids, they obviously weren't legally owned. They were yeah. getting them in all kinds of goofy ways, but um, they're, they're coming in. I think even those kids would be in, you know, more intimidated and think twice about that if they knew that, you know, some of the teachers had weapons or, you know, they weren't, it wasn't going to be this easy thing to just brandish it and scare the guy that you're trying to scare or whatever. Right. Oh, because sure. that's usually why they do it. They're not, they're not bringing it in to actually have a gunfight that a lot of it is about machismo and, you know, showing off and stuff. Right. Um, but uh, obviously we, th th it, it's still, it's still not good for a kid to have a gun in school for any reason. Because no, it's very dangerous. And, you know, God knows what can happen. But, you know, backing up what you just said, it's important to note that I think it's 98.8% of the time any mass shooting, not only schools, happen in, in what are called gun-free zones. And, exactly. and, 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 you know, th these people are, they're not stupid. They, they want to make a splash. And they know that if they get killed right off the bat and they don't kill somebody else, that's not going to be as newsworthy as if they take a bunch of people with them. Right. So it's obvious you know, just judging by the numbers that they're going to go into places where they know they can get away with it for a while. Right. Right. Exactly. Now you talked about, um, in your piece, you talk about the epidemic of fear because you, you challenge the notion that there's this epidemic of shootings right. very well with, you know, trashing their, you know, their statistics are wrong. And, yes. but you did mention the epidemic of fear. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. What, what do you, what do you mean when you say that? And what, what, is, what are they talking about? Well, actually, I was quoting somebody by the name of uh, James Allen Fox, who's a criminologist at Northeastern University. And he's been tracking these events for years. And, and you know, and he, he said there have been, thir you know, he knows there have been 13 mass shootings since 1966. Mm -hmm. So and, and the exact quote was, you know, what's increasing and is out of control is the epidemic of fear. Because when these things happen, and clearly it's a tragedy, it's a tragedy for the town, and of course a tragedy for the parents and the children who were killed, and the, and the two teachers who were killed. 
but this is not a an epidemic. It is not. I mean, it, it hardly ever happens. I mean, putting your kid in a car tomorrow or sending him to school, he's much in much greater danger being in a car, even with a seatbelt on. Right. So I mean, we have to keep these things in perspective. But of course, everybody jumps on things like this and 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 pushes their favorite causes and fixes, and and it's it's really wrong. And I mean, I've read so much about this, Deb. And it, it's it just, I mean, it gets me sick sometimes, with the, the attitude that people have. And, uh, mm-hmm. and that's one of the reasons I, I wrote the piece, because I, I try to present it in a way that, that was sort of, I, I thought, calm. <laughs> no, it was. was. It, yeah, and you just broke it down, you know, took apart their statistics and everything. And, and the thing, too, is that when you talk about things like, you know, an epidemic of fear, I start to think about the unintended negative consequences. We already mentioned it. They're turning them into activists or they're making the children afraid. I mean, you're when you're a kid going to school, you've already got dozens of reasons to be anxious. Okay. Whether it's, you know, your grades or, you know, maybe the kids don't like you or right. whatever's going on. There's all kinds of things going on right now. And to add that for any teacher, you know, we talk about being safe at school to me, statistically, the child is more likely to be literally unsafe emotionally and even physically from their fellow students just on a day-to-day basis of, you know, bullying and getting in fights and stuff. And I don't see a lot of attention being paid to that in a healthy way. I'm seeing a lot of talk about let's screen all the kids and put them on drugs and all this SEL stuff. And, and I keep coming back to the common denominator when there is a mass school shooting is that the shooter decided, this nihilistic suicidal person decided to go to a school, first of all, lots of soft targets, malls, other places, right? Parks. They go to a school. They shoot up a school. And I can't shake the feeling that part of their motive is to fight back at the school. Like there's a piece of me wondering, why are we not looking at why that place? Yes, it's a soft target, but it feels like there's something else going on too. And I, I wonder if we should be mm-hmm. thinking about that when we then turn around to the kids and be like, you know, be in your feelings, be in your feelings all the time. I don't know that that's healthy. Like maybe yeah, well, we're creating I, a problem. I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. That's a great point, especially these days, because for about two years, the kids were told that they were going to kill grandma with COVID. Mm-hmm. And, that, and the ongoing uh, fear mongering has been about climate change. Don't get me started. Um, and, it's needlessly frightening children and it's disgusting. And then you know, and now we have this, oh yeah, well, somebody's going to come to school tomorrow and shoot it up. And the, those bad guys in the NRA want more people to have guns. This is terrible. We need to go out in the streets and more, you know. Um, whether the, uh, your other interesting point about whether or not the killers pick schools because they're angry, I, you may be right. I, I don't know. I, maybe in some cases, somebody's angry at the school, the teachers, the principal, the system. Uh, you know, that they, they, they got bad grades. That that I really don't know. But as a generally, I think they they picked schools because they know they're primarily gun free zones, and you get a whole you get. I hate to say it, more bang for your buck. You have a whole classroom full of people. You don't have to go okay. shooting them all over the place. But you have all you have a captive audience, so to speak. That's very and the very other true. important thing, I mean, such a simple fix is keep your doors locked, teachers. You know, just like at home, you keep your doors locked. You, you don't, you know, you know, and if somebody comes to the door, they knock, and you if they, you know that person that really is right. harmless, you let them in. If it's a stranger, sorry, uh, no, you know, I'm selling, I'm sorry, I'm not interested. Um, right. and, and the classroom should be the same thing. Now, of course, the principal would have a key. The, uh, the, the janitor would have a key. But this guy could not, if that teacher had that door locked, that room would not have been entered into by that nut. Right. I think I read that one of the problems they had, ironically, tragically, is that this school was outfitted. And in fact, just in the end of March, they had a drill. It was outfitted with doors that locked from the inside so that with little tiny skinny windows, so you can't see, and the door and the windows were covered so you can't see from the outside. And the idea there is what you said, locked from the inside to keep them safe. But they had an assembly that day with parents in the morning. And apparently the way he got into the building was the mm. teacher had left the door propped open because parents were coming and going. And then the doors to the classrooms were more open because parents had been coming and going. He came in not long after the last of the parents had left after the assembly and they didn't just, you know, lock it all up tight again. And then when he came in and went and barricaded himself in a classroom, 
he closed the door. Right. That kept them out. And worse than that, the bathrooms are Jack and Jill between the classrooms so that he could move between classrooms right. safely. It was a nightmare. And then only the janitor had a key. Right. There and, should and be the principal. And, 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 of course, and once the bad guy was in the room, he locked the door. Correct. So. So, yeah, so it was yeah, like well, the safety measures even worked against them. And yeah, well, you know, it, it, it's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, you just have a single entrance to a school, right? And you know, parents come in and you and have you don't know, let your guard it, down, don't prop it open, don't get complacent, right. you know? Yeah, no, it, it's yeah, yeah I mean, this That's, is just common sense stuff. I'm sorry, right? You, just, you know, if you, if you leave your door open, you're asking for trouble. Any, anybody can just walk in then. Right. AD, and thank that, you for the super chat. AD says, in elementary school, I was acting out and they wanted to put me on in spe into special education and on Ritalin. My mom put me in wrestling and I ended up fine. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for that comment. I think there, there's a point to be made there that the we they're men, they're, they're boys or young men who are doing these things primarily. And part of why I mentioned it is there are certain common denominators. It's like we're not really looking at. We always look at the gun. And then I'm thinking like, okay, what's, what are we doing maybe to boys or what's happening to, you know, young men at this age or, you know, what messages aside from the, the world is going to hell in a handbasket and all the adults screwed up and you have nothing to look forward to is probably right. not very healthy. Right? I don't mean no, to laugh, fine. but it, you're going to, you're going to cultivate that in somebody's mind. There might be one in a, you know, 10,000 who takes it all the way. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we live in a time now where masculinity is sort of uh, conflated with what's being called toxic masculinity. It's not a good time to be a boy, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And yeah, th this is a, a great part of the problem. And, and yeah, too many kids are on drugs. I mean, R Ritalin being, uh, well, I don't even know if that's, that was the drug du jour for a long time. I think it's and like Adderall it, now. They do Adderall. I, I believe I believe you're right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I've been, I've, Follow that too closely, but yeah, I mean, and you know, the, and, and usually the, the, these are boys being uh, boys. This is what boys do. And yeah, I mean, there, there there is such a thing as ADHD, but it's very rare, and and that needs psychiatric attention. But most of the time, it's just boys being boys, and yeah, you need to be calmed down, slapped, put in their place. Just okay, you're done now, enough, or you know, you're going to be grounded, you know, whatever. Right, right, and you know, it, it it's. It seems like today they in schools they are using the word empathy in a way that is not empathetic. It's in other words it's it's permissiveness it is like you know you're really not helping the child or any of the other children in the school or the classroom or the adults for that matter. Um, when you decide you're going to, you know, try to understand every little behavior and, 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 or pathologize every behavior, like this is a sign of some kind of illness. No, maybe they're just being a jerk. You know, <laughs> it's like, maybe no. they just need some discipline. Right. And yeah. It, I mean, yeah, well, the discipline has become a dirty word and we have what's laughingly called restorative justice mm -hmm. where kids, you know, if, if, if boy A beats the tar out of boy B, boy B has to sit in a room with him and, and you know, understand A's problem and, and why he did it. I mean, what a crock. I mean, this is, I mean, like I grew up in the fifties, you know, and may, maybe I'm a dinosaur, but I sure <laughs> think that I, uh, I had a better education than kids are getting these days. Well, that's, I, I, uh, I know right. that's, that's the key. You know, we, we see so many people saying we need to improve this and improve that and change this and change that. And I'm over here going, wait, we put, we put people on the moon, um, <laughs> with the old way yeah. and invented the supercomputer and AI and the internet. And, you know, so I'm, I guess I'm failing to say even cures for cancer. There's people who are much older than the average teacher today who did all that. People love to make an archive oh, rumor, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, they put a man on the moon. So, you know, maybe settle down. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just at a loss to understand why there isn't a larger contingent of people in your profession and above that, you know, the teachers of the teachers and the people in the professional associations crying out for, for save the knowledge based curriculum and pushing back on these lunatics who want to just make everything about my feels and, and, and we got to decolonize this and decolonize that because I think what's happening and I do think it's connected to this shooting stuff, but is that these kids really are like nihilistic. They don't have any sense of appreciation, gratitude, joy, perspective, mm -hmm. 
any of it, even at a childlike level, right? That there's something to look forward to that growing up is going to be this at least semi cool thing. And instead, I, I see this, you know, like everybody screwed up the world and now it's your job to fix it, little kids. Um, and I, I just, I'll be honest, I'm surprised there aren't more events hmm. because it, to me, it's a reflection of something deeply sick in the culture, not just the individual. Yes, the individual, but something is up, even as rare as they are. If you go back to your you know, generation when you were in school, didn't happen at all. And no. that's a generation where kids probably had a, you know, their hunting rifle maybe in the back of their truck. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, that's in a the high school point, parking right? lot, you know? Yes. Just didn't um, even, ha it didn't happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Kids used to bring guns to school for good reasons. Now, if a kid brings a gun to school, it's uh, not for a good reason. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah, well, just to go back to something, yeah, I want to hook on to something you said earlier about the grown ups. Why aren't more people? Because people are afraid. Teachers are afraid to speak up. They'd be afraid of call racist. If they want to leave the union, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to leave the union because they're afraid of, you know, what people will say about them. And, and you know, in the, in the union case, I mean, I've been fighting the unions for most of my adult life at this point. And, um, you know, you know, people, you know, and I, when I tell people they're going to leave the union, I said, yeah, you might wind up eating lunch in, in your room by yourself. And I said, I went, I had a, I had a union light school, L-I-T-E, and I had a couple of teachers that stopped talking to me, but my life wasn't affected, but I, I guide teachers and I tell them that you, you might, you know, so, and so it, it takes a little bit of uh, gumption to, to, to take on the union establishment and the general ed establishment and all the CRT stuff, and, and God knows there are brave teachers out there, but we need a lot more of them because the uh, the ed establishment, which is essentially you know the, the, you know what's become a corporate education setup, and 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 their unions, the government-run teachers' unions, uh, are running the show, and we need more boots on the ground people, grassroots people, to speak up and to act and say no, this is wrong. I'm not going to tell little my little white kindergartner that he's oppressing the, my little black kindergartner. This is crazy talk. I will, right. will not do it. Or put doubt in their mind about what gender they are or that they should doubt that their parents no, really love them and, you know, keep, I'll keep your secret and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I just think it's, it, it's a, a toxic soup. And I, I mean, whether they end up hurting other people or hurting themselves, I just don't think this is a healthy environment overall and, you know, taking guns away from law abiding citizens, adults outside the school, I don't think is no. is going to solve this particular problem. But I really just don't understand. And I never will understand the lack of I mean, I I get the the money incentives and I get the fear. But I just still feel like there ought to be a contingent of people who are at least willing to say I mean, we're seeing a little bit of it. I saw a piece a couple of weeks ago where they took on Lucy Calkins finally. Mm -hmm. And you I was like. Thank you. 30 years too late, but thanks. <laughs> Better late than ever, yeah. 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 She's walking back some of her stuff, apparently. Uh, yeah. I mean, getting yeah. more back to phonics. Yeah. But, but 30 years worth of kids have been, if not ruined, so, at least somewhat damaged by people like right. Calkins and people like her. You know? Right. And then we have, to the California math framework and the piece that just came out the other day from the Stanford Review saying, oh, by the way, these two people, they have a lot to personally gain from you know the writing and the adoption of this framework that dumbs down math further than it already was and of course i'm over here going and who didn't know this <laughs> like, who wasn't paying attention oh yeah and well this, the, yeah, yeah i'll just say yeah the math framework and the uh ethnic studies mandate are big big topics out here and right exactly uh, you're on top of it so but i feel like it it's it's connected to violence in schools, whether it's school shootings or just random violence and disrespect and misbehavior in schools. I feel like the lack of rigor in the curriculum, the uh, the focus on feelings and the restorative justice and all, I think it makes all of that worse. It does. I, I just have it. Maybe I, 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 I'm a dinosaur too, but I feel like you get what you expect from kids. And so when you expect very little, you that's what you get. 
And if you go in and ex you set the standard and you expect them to behave a certain way and you have a standard of rigor and you're going to get, you're going to fail. If you don't do this, it's going to, and I know there are a lot of people don't like that. They think, well, that makes school really terrible. I'm like, I didn't say it had to be boring and dumb and arbitrary. I just said it had to be rigorous Rigor. and it has to be purposeful. And I'm not seeing that. And so if I'm a kid, kids, when I was teaching, one, one thing I noticed, tell me if you had the same experience is kids have a pretty good BS meter, a lot of them. And they, if they see that you're phony, like, or you're just like, eh, you know, phoning it in or, or towing the party line or something, they're going to find every which way in the world to get around you to, you know, like play uh, you, manipulate you, all that. Yep. Yeah, no, they're, they're, they're all very smart, at least in that way. They, they know how to, 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 to run the system, so to speak, and, and to, you know, get around what you're doing. And yeah, more rigor. And it's not a word, you know, we, I, punishment went out a long time ago, and then it became consequences, but at least a consequence for your action. Yes, yeah, so if you beat up little Joey, you're going to, we're not going to send you home for two days, because then you're going to sit and watch TV. Now, just to digress a little bit, we, you know, we used to suspend kids. And I would say, uh, what would you do? You know, kid beat up another kid. Oh, oh uh, I just I watch TV all day. So this is not punishment. Excuse me. This is, we, we have to figure out more creative ways of punishing a kid. And one way we had what were called in-house suspensions. And it was run by this guy who's a guidance counselor and was an ex-Marine. And he, he kept his room very hot. And he would <laughs> stand for hours at a time. And the kids hated it. And I loved it. It worked. I mean, I don't think he broke any rules. I mean, he, you know, the room was hotter than it should have been. I hated going in there because I started sweating. Um, but it worked. And, and as I said, sending kids home, oh, I, you know, my mother went to work. I watched TV all day. Right. So it, anyway. doesn't, it doesn't seem like a consequence. You're right. A lot, a lot of kids would like to get out of yeah. school. And it's probably yeah. one of the reasons. The, the, the reason they're acting up is they don't like school. So I'm going to punish them by sending them home? No, that makes no sense. That makes sense. Right. Well, unless you just the, said a some... No, I just can say, unless the parent buys in and, and doesn't let the kid watch TV all day long and, you know, right. whether or not she beats his rear end and, or, you know, whatever, it, you know, the yeah. parent will leave that up to the parent. But if a parent isn't going to do that, sending the kid home is, is, is a prize. It's not a punishment. Exactly. And you just said something, too. You said that they are acting up because they don't like school. Yeah, and, so that, yeah. and that's another thing. It's like they, they come up with every externalized reason that the kid is acting up. Like, did it ever occur to you? They're acting up because they can't read. So they can't really participate in anything or they're just plain bored or they, you know, don't understand anything that's going on. And it, like there, there are so many reasons. I think, what is it like 75 or 80% of the prison population is functionally illiterate? I've heard that. I, mean, I don't, yeah, I've yeah. heard that. So, I mean, if you, they talk about things like, you know, the school to prison pipeline, like, did it ever occur to you if you taught the kids to read? I mean, that's a pretty high correlation. I'm not saying it's causal, but it's certainly a high, it's a notable correlation. So mm -hmm. maybe, it, maybe, just maybe literacy is a, a skill that might help keep you out of prison and not, not punishing kids. Maybe, maybe yeah. that's the, the answer is making sure yeah. they can read. Yeah, well, I, yeah, all of the above. You know, we teach them to read. Obviously, that's why they're in school. Right. And you know, I don't understand you know how a kid can get out of school not being able to read. Uh, I think you know we had what was called I don't know if it's even still called a social promotion, where mm -hmm. you go from second grade to the third grade. You may you may not have learned a thing. Right. Uh, and so, but why are you promoting? You know, you, you go to the next grade, it means because you, you've achieved a certain level of skills. Right. And if you don't, why are you going to the next grade? And, you know, it's, and I think, you know, it hurts kids' feelings to spend enough. Yeah, then, then they're all this kid in their class and they're repeating second grade and the other kids call them stupid. So, but at least you have that. That's a motivation. Well, I don't want to be a year older than the kids in my class and I don't want to be called stupid. So I'm going to try real hard to get to the next level. And if you can't do it, then you will get the, get the kid a tutor or maybe psychological help. Right. Most people still have counselors. And um, yeah, I mean, when, when kids need help in school, they, you know, the, the teacher usually knows if a kid's got a you know, learning disability or this you know, problem at home right. that, that's causing him not, or her not to learn. And yeah. Right. What, what sort of more modern things that we have at our disposal do you think are good or would help prevent 
violent behavior. So in addition to those disciplining kids, whatever, are there any other preventive measures that you can think of in terms of dealing with students directly or young adults directly that could help prevent them turning their anger outward? Well, I think schools need to be very aware of when a child is going over the edge, so to speak. And it's not that hard to figure out because the kids act out. They usually don't just keep it inside. And if they do, they become, you know, like mummies and they never talk. And that's a red flag too. So kids, you know, usually will let a teacher know advertently or inadvertently that they're troubled. And these are the kids you need to call on the parents. You know, I mean, I don't know if there's anything newfangled these days, but just traditionally what I do, you know, you call the parents, you send them to the guidance counselor, you set up meetings with all of the above. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you talk to the kid and, you know, you can usually figure it out. It's not rocket science, you know, why a kid is learning or why a kid is, um, you know, acting out in a certain way. And, right. you know, obviously you, you, you need caring parents. And if you don't, it makes your job a whole lot harder. But then you have, you know, school shrinks and counselors and you know, administrators and, and older teachers who can, you know, share their wisdom. And yeah, and, and, and most of the time, I think it can be dealt with. And, and, you know, sometimes if a kid just can't be dealt with, then he's got to be shipped out. Mm -hmm. And ironically, I don't know how things are these days. We used to be, you shipped them out to a lot of times to a private school, which is, of course, you know, the, the, the bet noir of the teachers unions. You <laughs> send them to a private school, uh, you know, that specializes in, you know, tough nuts, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Now, you did mention restoring campus cops, too. Um, and obviously, that's gotten a lot of flack. What do you have to say about that? I don't understand why they got flack. I, I, I just never understood that. We, you know, I, the school where I taught, we always had a campus cop. One cop carried a gun visibly. You could see it in a holster. I had men, women, blacks, whites, Hispanics. Um, it was never an issue. And, you know, everybody, you know, you never want to run afoul of a cop, obviously, not, not because you're going to get shot, because he was a, a voice of authority and he had a walkie talkie and he could immediately or she could immediately, you know, call the police. What, I mean, it, it's just the whole general anti-cop thing in society and Black Lives Matter and, and cops, are, you know, discriminating and they're racist. And, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's just it's so disheartening to watch what's going on, and, and especially in the schools, because they need more campus cops these days, not fewer. As I brought up, um, there's a wonderful website called Just Facts, and, and uh, it's run by a man by the name of James Agresti, who pointed out, you know, that in the Superdome, you know, they have, uh, I forget how many, you know, it, it comes down to about one cop per 80, 80 people, you know. Ow. In, in the Super Bowl. Oh, that's pretty good. I didn't yeah, so, realize it was that, that okay. Yeah. Right. So, you know, if it's, you know, cops, you know, if the cop is in the Super Bowl, um, you know, why cops in school? So at a school of 600, as I pointed out, you know, maybe seven or eight cops. Why not? Right. And, you know, it's, it's so ironic because, you know, whether it's, you know, President Obama or President Trump, uh, I won't even dignify the current president. <laughs> uh, when they, these kids, their kids get sent to school, they had armed, you know, armed guards. Watching over them. What? Why is it okay for a president's kid to, to have that and not not the rest of our kids? Or or them. I mean, it, what bothers me are you have even local politicians who have you know bodyguards and they have you know police escorts and they have things like that yeah. to guard them, and then the kids who attend the schools in their districts. No, they're not. They're they're it's like open season on them, and and even at the courthouse they secured the courthouse. Right. And, 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 and even after 9-11, we had uh, pilots. There was a law passed that allowed pilots with training to carry guns in the cockpit. Right. I, mean, I was thrilled by that. I mean, after 9-11, who the hell wants to be on a plane where, where nobody else is armed except the crazy people? Exactly. So, exactly. But somehow and, in school, oh, no, no, no. We, we want schools to be safe. But, <laughs> yeah, we're so safe. We have no means of protecting ourselves. And you know, it's it, it would be one thing if they did drills where they taught the kids how to use the fire extinguishers as a weapon. You know, like here's how you hit someone over the head with a fire extinguisher, or blind them with it, or whatever. I mean, I could be down with that. Or throw, here's how to throw a chair. You know, it's but it's all this like duck and hide. You know, like run away if you can, but there aren't exit doors inside the classroom to run outside the building. I've always wondered about that. Why don't they have a door 
in each classroom that just if it's not on the second floor, you could just like open it and run. Somebody's in the building, you leave the building. If that one's locked from the inside, but you need to get out, just go. Yeah. And everybody uh, could exit yeah, the building. I, I, I don't know. I'd have to think that's an interesting thought. I mean, you know, obviously you'd have to redesign schools, you know, greatly to have a second door. But we can uh, spend $122 billion on SEL. Yeah, right. It's funny. That, that, I mean, as I said, I've read tons on this issue, but I had not encountered that. And I think it's something certainly worth considering. Yeah, I just, so, I feel like if we, we we appropriated so much money for for plexiglass around the decks and all these things, which never got implemented, and HVAC systems uh, that purify the air and all of these things to protect these kids from something that we, we knew in like April wasn't killing them. Um, and yet we've had these school shootings that I'm still waiting for them to redesign the buildings yeah, on mass. I, I, yeah, I think that's true. But as something else you said, I, I have to take issue with when you, you talked about, you know, getting preparing kids for this. I think it is so unlikely. I know it's that so is unlikely. True. I, I have, you're right. You're right. But I, I think you, you might do more damage by scaring these kids and, you know, mm -hmm. like having active shooter drills. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't no, know. I, 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 I do. I do agree. I was simply saying like they do active shooter dr drills, but they're very passive. And so I feel like if you're going to be, yeah. if you're going to well, bother the kids, yeah, if you're yes. going to do it and you're going to teach these kids something really terrifying that's unlikely to happen. It's like when I was a kid, we did duck and cover drills. Um, that gave me that. Right. But I remember those. Right? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, my desk yeah. is going to protect me from the nuclear yeah, yeah. bomb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I was too young to really get that. But, you know, take cover and, you know, everybody like crashed on the floor. Everybody yes. knew what to do. And, you know, you say, and you got to talk to your friend, a little, you know, whisper to your friend a little bit who's under the table with you. And yeah, and you know, we didn't know much about uh, you know atom bombs and hydrogen bombs. Oh yeah, that'll do a lot of good. <laughs> yeah, right. Exa exactly. Hiding under the desk. <laughs> Hiding under the desk. And yeah. uh, I, I remember yeah. those, and they would show us where that, like this part of the school is a fallout shelter. What's fallout? Yeah. Oh, radiation is really you know. And then you're, you're in like fourth grade, you're like, oh my god. Um, but so, but if they do the drills. And my qualm with the drills is they're super passive. And what concerns me is when my daughter was in seventh grade, there was a walkout for gun safety and all these kids were walking out. And I was very critical of it, called the superintendent. I said, why are you allowing? He was allowing it district wide. They were like planning for it and arranging for them to be escorted out of the building. I said, this is so inappropriate. And as a parent, I am a protesting. I think this Good. is wrong. It's interfering. He said, well, the Supreme Court, I said, no, you're wrong about that. The Supreme Court said the student doesn't lose their right to free speech, but it doesn't mean they won't get punished or have a consequence for skipping class. And it doesn't mean the school gets to assist them in their free speech. Now the school is speaking. Now yeah. the school is expressing a political opinion. That's different. Oh, no, we're just keeping them safe. And I said, right. really? By taking an entire class period away from all the students, my daughter is one of like seven kids who stayed in the building. But before it happened, she asked because the kids who were staging it put up posters all over the hallways. We're going to have a walkout. So she she made a bunch of pro Second Amendment posters with quotes from like the founders and things, right? And she went to the principal and they were all printed up beautifully. And she said, "Can I put these up too? These are my I have free speech too." He said, "No, I changed my mind. I'm taking down all the posters, which had already been up for two days." He took them down and then so she stayed in the, in the building and then she decided she got, got a fire in her belly. And when they had to do a project about for like health class or something about uh -huh. keeping kids safe, she wanted to do a presentation on, you know, what would be pr appropriate safety drills in the event of an event, you know, a st somebody coming in the school. And she wanted to bring somebody in from the outside. There was an organization that did teach kids more active measures of defending themselves even without, you know, actual weapons. Okay. And they said, no, they said, our policy is that we, you know, we hide and then we, you know, if we can, we run away. And she said, but they have a program and it really it teaches kids how to feel like more powerful if they're in that situation. And they, they turned her down. So she had an early education about how people aren't really looking for solutions. They're looking for a specific specific kind of solution why not let her try it why not let her have the organization come in and talk to them because that's not quote politically correct and it uh, goes against the program and right. you know i don't even know the, the principal may have even thought she had a good idea but he may have been afraid of getting 
some heat from the school board or his administrator, you know, the administrator that he reports to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just every time something like this happens and, you know, you're right, it doesn't happen as often as the media would like us to think. But when it does, it makes a big splash. And I keep thinking, you know, you'll hear people say they haven't changed anything. I've done anything. I'm like, who's they? First of all, because I don't see the education establishment doing anything but banging the same drum. Government mm -hmm. and educate. They're just banging the same drum to your point. That's going to have the same lack of impact you you're not going to get rid of the guns and right. even if you did i'll say to people like which of the gun laws that which what is a common sense gun law because they always call it common sense gun law what is a common sense gun law that could have prevented that that event mm -hmm. and they they just have nothing to say they, they, and they'll say things like a registry and like well theoretically we have that we're not supposed to but we do mm -hmm. and then they'll say well background checks we have that right and um so they have they have, as you pointed out, they have laws they aren't enforcing. Yeah, you, you left out, uh, we need to get rid of assault weapons. All right. I guarantee 99% of the people who say that don't know what an assault weapon is. No. And they, like Randy Weingarten said that, you know, an, an AR-15 can fire 600 rounds a minute. Where does she get this from? <laughs> yeah, no, matter. I think it, even with a bump stock, it couldn't do that. Yeah, I, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, it, it's a, yeah, and I, I know you know what a semi automatic is, but if, in case somebody doesn't know, it means you have to pull the trigger each time you want a bullet to come out. Yeah. So, you, can you imagine doing that 600 times in 60 seconds? I don't think so. No. The only thing and you don't have to do is you don't have, it's not a revolver, you don't have to do this. Right. And, you know, it's a, yeah, we can hold more bullets. Yeah. Okay. But still, it's, but, you know, but, but, but most people don't know what the, the point being that most people do not know what a semi automatic versus yeah. an automatic is. No. Yeah, and then they'll talk about things like the rounds it fires and the speed at which it goes. And it's like, yes, because a rifle is designed to rifle the bullet. I mean, that's the, it's a different kind of weapon. So, but that doesn't mean it's a weapon of war. People go hunting no, with no. them, right? It's not, it's not, you know, the, all these people are being killed by semi automatic. Guns. It's, these aren't these kids aren't getting their hands on an M16 and you know, you know no. no. So no. let's you know let's leave that out of the argument, please. Right. And even in Nigeria the other day, tragically they had a, a shooting in a Catholic church. It killed 50 people, and mm. they've banned guns there. They have very strict gun laws in Nigeria. And somebody came in with an actual machine gun and did mm. this deed. So I mean, as you pointed out, the bad guys are going to get what they're going to get they're going to do what they're going to do. Yep. And there's, you know, with the, the thing to think about would be where are the bad guys coming from that want to go into schools? Why schools? Why this particular cohort of violent offender? And what do we not know about them yet? Like, let's study them, not just go after people who weren't involved at all. Like 400 million guns or whatever it is, <laughs> didn't hurt anybody yesterday. Right. However many there were, they didn't, and they won't hurt anyone today. So why, why are we talking about that? But um, I'm, I'm just still concerned about what's happening in the culture of the schools. Um, yeah, well, that, but, you know, I, I, it's important to keep things in perspective because mass shooting, not all mass shootings, obviously, are school shootings. And as I mentioned That's earlier, true. that there have been 13 in the in the last since 1966. True. That's six years, right? Yeah. 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 So. You know, this isn't exactly a uh, you know a fad or a craze or you know, it, you know it, it hardly ever happens. That's true. You know, so, so I you know I, I don't I don't know that there's enough of a, a, a database there to really make strong generalizations about who's doing it. Right, right. And I you know since we since it has come up in this program, I know we were talking about this article that you did about Uvalde, but it, the SEL component and talking about mental health has come up. And I know you've written a piece about not buying into SEL. Um, mm -hmm. Could you share with my audience your, your just overall take on SEL as an experienced educator? Yeah, well, it's, it's what it is. It's become, I mean, well, education is, a, is I wrote as a fad filled field and, and SEL is just, an, you know, another, one of them and you know it just sort of looks after the, the the sort of the emotional end of the educational spectrum which in and of itself you know it may or may not be bad but it's become too important in a sense 
and it's, it's become an intrusion to the field. And now in, in the 90s, well, actually more recently, uh, it, it's become blatantly political. Uh, is, is the group that's behind this is called the Collaborative to Advance Social and Emotional Learning. Castle. And and basically, um, you know, and they say that it's evidence based, which is not. <laughs> and, you know, and, and then they went to what's called transformative SEL, which calls for students. And I'm quoting here from them, critically examine root causes of inequity. There's that buzzword inequity. And according to Castle, the concept of transformative SEL is a means to better articulate the potential of SEL to mitigate the educational, social and economic inequities that derive from the interrelated legacies of racialized cultural oppression in the United States and globally. Give me a break. So, the, you know, this is just part of the whole CRT, BLM, BS, frankly. And, and it's, uh, you know, and, and just parents need to become aware of this. Right. And they, they did this in 2020 recently. It's a brand new thing, and it probably hasn't taken hold in that many schools. But, uh, you know. <laughs> I wish said, that were true. The, the fad uh, will continue unless it's, uh, you know, parents start right. uh, speaking about it. Well, with the most recent uh, infusion of cash from the federal government, the ESSER funds are tied directly to SEL and the school, every state applied for them. And the requirement is they must use materials or programs that are CASEL compliant. In other words, CASEL's competencies yeah. define what will get you the funds. Yeah, well, most of the education establishment uh, re resembles, uh, <laughs> say, the field that contains ladies of the night. They will do anything for money. <laughs> well, you know, I was just yeah. about to ask you, I was just about to ask you what you're, you know, because people have different theories. Obviously, you've seen that's Marxists taking over the world, which I mean, I'm a little, little bit agree with. But, um, but then, you know, people say, no, they're just greedy. You know, they just want money. Others say it's a mixture. They're true believers and they're money grubbers. And then there are those who would say, no, they're just dumb. <laughs> they're just, they're just like know. gullible and they'll buy it, you know, like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. And they do whatever. So what, well, what do you think you're of the motive? Every one of the, it's definitely D, all of the above. Okay. It, 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 a, lot, a lot of them are just very, uh, you know, equity oriented and, and, and Marxist in their outlook. And some want money and some are dumb and... And, and I, I would add another one. Some are afraid. They think, okay, this is what everybody's doing. I better do it too. Right, right. So I think those, that, 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 those four pretty well cover it. How do we help the scared people not be scared? Now, I mean, it's hard to tell somebody, like, don't worry about losing your job. But I just believe, maybe I'm an optimist, but I believe if you had more people who were actually speaking up, the fear, you wouldn't lose your job because the, the numbers – would overwhelm the people trying to fire you. It would be blatantly obvious you're being fired for your political views, which is not legal. You can't do that. So, well, it, 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 I'm sorry. I, mean, I was going to say it's the perception they're alone, I think. Well, it's like, you're right. It's like anything else, though. There's safety in numbers. And um, uh, I remember a story uh, when I was still teaching, I overheard, I was a conservative and I didn't dare mention that. I didn't have any reason to, and I didn't want to jeopardize any relationship I had. And I heard an aide speak to somebody else, uh, a, a, an office worker. She said, oh, Lucy, I was down in Orange County this weekend. I love it. It's so conservative there. And I was like, what? So there's another conservative on campus? So anyway, and I, I went up to Lucy. I said, you're conservative? Oh, yeah. And, and she pointed out five other people or six other people on campus. Who were, and I went and I talked to them in hushed tones. Oh, you're conservative? Oh, really? Me too. Yeah. And so, yeah, and the one, you, you, it just takes a little, you know, in my case, it was just luck, really. But, you know, you just you have to speak up and, and not be afraid. You know, there's always somebody who's willing to take a few punches and then there's somebody who's almost, and then you can provide that inspiration to them. And then, and then you have two. And then when you have two, if each of you two can find two others, you have four. So, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not rocket science. I don't think you just need, you know, a few brave people. And then, the, you know, frankly, the sheep will follow. Right. And then what about, I know you've also written, we were going to talk about school choice, but I mean, it's a it's sort of a, a topic for another day, but there is one question I would ask you about school choice for teachers, meaning you know, so we have this pipeline of teachers and the coming from the new, the new pipeline. Right. Mm -hmm. And that to me is going to make, you know, whether it's charters or private schools or whatever is sort of waters down the differences a little bit, because ultimately a school is only as good as its teachers. I mean, that's what makes right. the school. 
Um, but I know there are a lot of teachers who, you know, aren't retired like you, but they're in that middle, you know, they're in that category of like, I'm scared and I want to teach the old way, you know, like the, 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 the competent way, the knowledge based way. Um, but I see that the private schools are already going down the progressive path or they're already there. A lot of them are worse than the public schools in some cases. And, and then, you know, even some of the charters are realizing like, we're not going to get our charter unless we kiss the ring of the progressives up in you know Sacramento or whatever. And so what do you, th what, what do you think can be done to help the teachers who want school choice for that themselves to be able to continue teaching, but to not have to do what everybody else is doing like this? What do you see well, people I doing and what do you recommend? Well, I mean, you, you rightfully said that a lot of private schools are going down the progressive road, but a lot aren't. And frankly, if you want to teach and you, you, you know, and, if, you, if you're teaching in a school that, that's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm just thinking about my own case. I mean, we, things were not nearly as politicized then. We had a multicultural day, but it's nothing like it is now. And if I, if my principal came to me and said, "You have to teach," uh, you know, about uh, you know, the, you know, the BLM, yes, as I said it before, um, I wouldn't do it. I mean, I just, you know, and I, I don't know if the union would protect me, but and. You know, so you have to go out on a limb, and I guess if it gets bad enough, you need to find a private school or a charter school that will accept you, you know, as you. And right. they're still there. There's still plenty there. I mean, you know, we, we always hear about the, the the more extreme cases, but not every school, public, private, or charter, is like that. So right. you know, teachers need to, you know, might have to move around a little bit. I'd love to see love teachers start schools. You know what I mean? Like to to have like a small group of teachers just say, all right, you do math, I do English, you do science, you do government or civics or whatever, you know, and like whatever the case may be and start getting a group of, of subject matter experts together who really still want to teach and are willing to take on a small group of kids who really want to learn and parents who are really want to participate and just start it, you know. Just yeah, no, that would be great, but um. I most teachers are not entrepreneurs. I mean, I hate to say this, but teaching, especially in a, in a public school, in a government school, is, is as safe a job as you can get. You basically can't get fired. It's so hard to get fired. So who's going to go into a, a job where you can't get fired? Right. Somebody who's frankly on, on more on the passive side. So if you, and the you, you know, entrepreneurs tend to... We get the entrepreneurs in places like um, Teach for America. You get more independent types there, and they tend to go from school to school and eventually get out of the profession. But yeah, I mean, you, I mean, there certainly are entrepreneurs, and they definitely should start schools. But you know, m most teachers will not do that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the Teach for America has even been captured. I went over there just yesterday and was looking at their content. It was all DEI, social justice, and. Yeah on their website. So they're obviously attracting activist teachers too. Um, do you think there's hope for the pipeline of teachers that, you know, as far as from universities or any ed schools or anything, any pathways that you see that are challenging the narrative? No, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, well, I, I shouldn't say, I mean, I, I won't bore you with my ed school experience, but I, I think that's typical of most. And it's just a huge waste of time. And most ed schools are, you know, in the left wing tradition. I'm sure if you go to like a Hillsdale, it's a different story. But how many Hillsdales are there? And maybe Grove one. City. <laughs> it's just yeah, I mean, I'm sure they're out there, but uh, yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I don't see much change. I mean, the, 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 the change, the, the good change I see is on school boards where parents are uh, ticked off. They're running for school board. They're getting elected. We all know what happened in Virginia. Right. Uh, Mr. Youngkin and um, uh, Terry McAuliffe got the boot. Um, right. Now, I'm not overly optimistic, but, um, right. you know, every day. Well, is, an, uh, it's an important point, though, because if the people coming out, if people, are, if people really are going to ed school because that's what they're doing to become teachers and oh, your cat, you've got a cat um, and that's feeding, you know, the pipeline of teachers. And we have a teacher shortage to start with. So we have a shortage and then the people coming in and being recruited into it or being do recruited. We, do, we a lot. A, do we have a shortage? You sure? Well, that's, what, that's what we're told. 
Oh, we, we, <laughs> what we're told. Yeah, no, we, we, when you look back, I mean, I, it's funny, I, I recently saw a picture of my third grade class, I had 43 kids in it, one teacher and no aid. So class ah. sizes keep getting smaller. And so, yeah, you're going to eventually have a teacher shortage. I'm going to be writing about that soon. I mean, I, I'm sure there's some districts and maybe even some states where they're short, but a, a shortage writ large, I don't buy it. Well, thank you for calling me out on being I don't, mindlessly buying the narrative on that because I actually hadn't looked into it. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the correction. I I just didn't have bought into it. Like, oh, they said there's a teacher shortage, but I never even thought about yeah, it. Well, yeah, you check, thank check, you. I'm curious. Check out the numbers. See what you see what you think. I will. And I want to address this comment from J.C. Porter. He says, I think I, he says there is no epidemic, but we should arm teachers. And I think he's being a little sarcastic. I want to make sure you understand that when we're talking about that, we're all, we're talking about maintaining discipline and order in the school in general, not warding off school shooters. So the, the, if you had armed you know, cops in the school or you had armed teachers in the school, you would have a deterrent to all kinds of violence. And we, we do see what we do see more commonly today is just generalized violence. Kids even beating up teachers. Um, yes. I know, well, I know a teacher like, who was put in the hospital by by a student, a female student. So yeah, ever since ever since COVID, this has has become a, a very big problem. Right, and I'm not and suggesting the teacher should shoot the students. Please don't hear me saying that. What I'm saying is that when there's a perception that the adults in the building are serious about keeping the kids who are not misbehaving safe. And that if you take on a, a violent, if you become violent or you bring in a weapon or whatever, there are adults in the building who are armed, it, it acts as a deterrent. I think yeah. that is the point. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you, if you were going to go rob a, a bank, you probably wouldn't do it if there was a, a guard sitting there with a gun. I mean, unless you plan on doing it in the guard, but no, okay, I'm going to go to the bank across the street. They don't have an armed guard. Right. I mean, it's, right. Duh. it's common sense. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it, obviously anybody who's going to carry a gun anywhere in public should be well trained and oh, only absolutely. do it voluntarily. <laughs> There's I mean, yeah. I have a I have a concealed carry permit, but I, if, you know, the one thing I learned is you do not do it if you are not prepared fully prepared and trained to do it. You that's the thing most people don't understand about legal gun owners is they're extraordinarily responsible. Most of them, most. Sure, that's no, no, absolutely. Full training. And I mean, and, and te in Texas, uh, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but Texas has a teacher carry law, but less than 1% of teachers carry. I mean, I, I, you know, obviously the teacher who was uh, killed in that room didn't carry. If that, if that teacher had a gun, not that many kids would have been killed. And maybe some kids would have been killed, but not nearly as many. Right. And, and the thing is, if you're going to have controls like the doors are locked from the inside, as we saw in Valde, it doesn't matter if you have 19 cops in the hallway, which is apparently what they had. They had a lot of cops there. And oh, well. I don't know if they didn't want to shoot the, the lock off the door because they didn't want to hurt somebody. or They were waiting for the janitor to unlock the door and they're killing kids calling 911. And it's, you know, it's not that they were afraid. I don't think they were like afraid to go in there. I mean, maybe they were, I don't think that was the issue. It's that there was this, the doors locked. Now it's all complicated. You're adding this layer there. They figure we haven't cordoned off. And I'm like, I, I can't think of the mentality. I don't want to think about the details because it'll make me too upset. But I just, I think when you are in a locked room and it's your life or the other guy's life and you're armed, it's a force equalizer. You have yep. at least a chance of survival Absolutely. is the point. And if you're properly trained, yes, your odds are better in that scenario of neutralizing the threat than the guys standing in the hallway who are much better armed. It's not the size of the weapon. This is no. the other thing we learned in concealed carry class is that it's not about how big your gun is, how powerful the bullets are, how fast they travel or any of that. It's much more about the skill of the shooter and your situational awareness and all those other kinds of things happens all the time. And, you know, people miss it, especially inexperienced shooters. They're like, yeah, my big gun is going to do things. And you, there's the person with the pistol goes Doing, and they're done. Yep. No, that's so, true. so many of these, these mass killings are done with, with handguns. I mean, yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. So it's, I think, I think you have to kind of analyze it a lot more. It's not just as simple as like, well, this guy had a bigger gun than that. That couldn't work because it doesn't, 
you know, guns, we watch too many TVs, movies and, <laughs> and stuff. And it, that's not when, when it is in real life, it's a lot different. So, well, Larry, yeah, I, I oh, okay. Sorry. Are we done? I was going to get what, just one no. last comment. I mean, if that yeah. teacher in, in Uvalde had had a gun, I don't know in what order the killer killed people, but if he started with the kids, that teacher could have shot the killer before he killed any more kids That's or maybe correct. he killed any kids. So, yeah, I mean, I can't see how anybody would be upset if that teacher had a gun. It couldn't have wound up any worse, could it? I don't see how. I mean, you know, people might say, well, she could have missed and hit a kid and this and that. But, I mean, we really don't know. In the in the chaos and the fog of these situations, yeah. we, we don't know. But the only thing we know for certain is that the people – inside the building had zero chance That's right. against them because they didn't have any equal force at all yeah. until the cops got there. And then by then it was too late because they were locked in the room. Yeah, no, having a teacher having, yeah. it's not a panacea, but it's better than yeah. not having a gun. Right. You know, that's, that's it. It's like if you're, worse, if you're in your house and we talked about this before we began the broadcast, you guys, I mentioned to Larry that I just read today in the news, there's a Michigan County, where they've used up their gas budget for the month. They just used it up and here we are June 9th. And they've told the public, we will not be able to respond to all 911 calls in person. So far this month, I think they have 57 911 calls in this little county. And so they don't have enough money for gas. So they're gonna have to triage the 911 calls and see which ones they show up for and which ones they don't. So when seconds count, Law enforcement may not be coming at all unless you can impress upon them that your case is like really super duper important. So you you have to think about, and even then, like where I live, they might come and they might be like, absolutely, we're on the way. Best case, 15 minutes. And I live in a city. They've told us that. Best case, 15 minutes, just because wow. of the lack of coverage and the distances they got to travel and everything else. And we were told by law enforcement officers your best bet is to either have a really vicious dog <laughs> or a gun or both preferably both because sometimes they'll take out your dog so the, that was the advice the, the police were saying it like, we can't be everywhere and we can't right. get to you and a lot of times we come to write up the police report we don't protect you that's not our job our job is not to come and protect you from the bad guy who is already right. in your house and just a minute have you lived in out in the country somewhere how long would it take them oh forget it i mean yeah. my, my dad lives in the country and they've are, they've told them straight up you better be armed because it's a half hour solid on a yeah. good day yeah no i mean well the, the great myth is is that the police really don't protect us and, and which is understandable you have to protect yourself the police will come later and you know maybe arrest a bad guy or maybe even shoot right. a bad guy but you have to take care of yourself. Right. And there are controls on the the rifles that people are calling assault weapons. They're 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 not there's no such thing as an assault weapon. That is actually like a, a political term that to that is used to describe cosmetic mark, you know, details like it's black and whatever. Um and what there are controls on rifles. You still have to go through a background check. You still have to you know, fill out tons of paperwork. When I bought mine, the process took about an hour and a half just to make the purchase. So the people owning the gun store had plenty of time in addition to run the my name and everything through CODIS. They they got to like talk to me and have me fill out all these forms. And it's, oh my God, multiple pages of paper that you have to fill out. It's not like, here you go. Here's your gun. Right. Right. And that's no, been proven I, no, so no, many I, times. I, I, I'm, a gun, I'm a gun owner. I, I mean, the last gun I bought was many years ago. But uh, yeah, I had to go through tons of paperwork and checks and this and that. And that. Yeah. And and the ammunition and all the things like the magazines. Like, it's not like there's no controls. You can't just, like, go do whatever you want. Um, and even when you buy online, people think you just go on a website. And do, no, you still have to have a registered agent receive it. Like, you can't receive it to your house. You can receive ammo. But you can't receive the weapon. Right. You can't order a gun to your house. Like people think that you could do. No, you've got to have a sense somewhere. I know. And You're somebody's right. got to receive it. So they don't know the journalists and the people that talk about these issues have not even after all this time, taken the time to research facts and sound semi-intelligent. They're perfectly okay to sound ignorant. Mm -hmm. yep. And I guess that means they only hope to speak to the people who are already as ignorant as they are. They're not interested in persuading us. 
Yeah, no. Well, but they think they're not. They don't know they're ignorant, which is the problem. If they, they knew they're, if you know you're ignorant, then you won't talk. But if you 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 think you know something, then you're going to try to convert people, and that's where the danger comes in. Yeah, that that is true. So so you said your next project, you're working on a piece on. Um, you just mentioned what you're going to be working on. Uh, I'm just going to. I think probably unless something else comes up uh, on class size and students dropping out of the system, you know, you know, at the same time. I'm sorry, teachers leaving the profession and students leaving the classroom. Okay. And, and somehow get that together. I, it's still up here. I haven't done anything. Okay. So um, I just shared a link to the Calif CaliforniaPolicyCenter.org. That's where you usually write for, right? And then also you write for... Um, uh, for kids and country, correct? Right, and and, and lately uh, I've got a steady gig with Front Page Magazine, which is oh, that's awesome. Okay, great. Yeah. So you can find Larry at those locations and follow along. You can subscribe. Also, I'm subscribed, so I get the articles delivered to my inbox, and you can keep up with what he's covering. And um, you know, you, you should parents, you should stay abreast of what, what's happening. Read a variety of different things because if you're just yeah. looking at the mainstream news, you're not getting the picture at all. And, uh, you know, so I'll be, I'll be keeping an eye out to see what that's about, because I'm very curious, is there really a mass exodus of teachers or is that another narrative? <laughs> so. Well, uh, well, uh, I, ha I haven't done all the research yet, so I don't even want to talk about it, but it's, it's okay. Probably but we'll, not what you okay. Get that guys. It's probably not what we think like everything else with education. <laughs> Larry, I got to thank you for coming in today and talking to me about this very important issue. I hope people will ask more questions in the future about things like school shootings. Um, the article link is in the description box below. Please do read it. It has all the links to Just Facts and other statistics. And you can, you know, have the, have the data. Use actual facts to have these conversations. Thanks, everybody, thank for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Always a pleasure. Okay, have a great day. Bye-bye.